All right, welcome everybody. Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce Barry Honig to you. Uh, Barry is somebody that uh, I met very, well, I, I, I met him through his papers almost immediately um, when I entered this field and, and met him shortly thereafter. Um, he's made enormous contributions, especially to the field of protein electrostatics and implicit solvent models for uh, proteins and macromolecules. Um, today he'll be talking to you about some newer work. Um, so Barry is uh, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor at Columbia University in uh, molecular biophysics, systems biology, and medicine. He's the director of the Computational Biology and Bioinformatics Institute there. And he has numerous awards. I almost feel like I should save half of this for tomorrow because there's such a long list here. But um, he has the Hollander Award in um, Hollander Award in Biophysics from the National Academy of Sciences, and is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, he has the Founders Award from the Biophysical Society, the Delano Award for Computational Bio. Um, Computational Biosciences and the Anfinson Award from the Protein Society, and honestly, I can't think of any other possible award that, well, maybe just one, but you know, any other possible award that somebody could win in uh, computational structural biology. Um, and uh, and very also, I asked him for a couple of hobbies, and he let me know that he is an avid scuba diver, and also wanted me to let you know that he played a year of football at the University of Florida before he went to uh, went to Brooklyn to get his uh, his degree in chemistry, and then on to the Weizmann Institute for a PhD. So, if you'll uh, please help me in welcoming Barry Honig as our Steenbach lecturer for 2016. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, I uh, heard for many years about the Steenbach Lectures, one of these things you don't actually think you'll ever be one. I'm really excited and delighted by the honor, and thank you for, for attending. Um, I, this is the title uh, of this talk, and uh, it's, it represents an area I began working on about 15 years ago. And I say right here with Larry Shapiro, because uh, when I became, I've done computational work all of my life, but uh, when I became a used investigator, I was able to uh, expand my interest to do experimental work as well. And uh, nobody would ever fund me to do experimental work. Uh, and, but Larry's a, an accomplished crystallographer, and together we set up a joint lab, and I think it's perhaps a way that some modern science can be, can be done. We have a single experimental lab and actually share computational students as well. We do crystallography, everything that goes along with that, cell assays, biophysical measurements, and the people working in the lab uh, aren't even sure who pays their salary. It's, it's, it's really a joint effort. So uh, all of my work on adhesion is done with Larry. We publish everything together and uh, I, I just want to start with that. Uh, I also wanted in part to advertise uh, tomorrow's lecture, uh, in part because I sent the wrong title. Uh, there was a typo that I never caught. But uh, there's a fundamental difference in, in what I'll be talking about today and tomorrow. Uh, today is, I'd say, more traditional biophysics. There's some cell biology in it. Um, it's really understanding how molecules work in a biological context. Uh, Tomorrow is, I'm going to be talking about the use of three-dimensional structure to uh, basically to predict what proteins interact, as it says, on a genome-wide scale. Uh, it's sort of low-resolution structure biology. Today will be high-resolution structure biology, and the, the differences are, are quite dramatic. So the sorts of problems we're interested in uh, are, are summarized here, and I'll be getting to some of them. But the basic question is, can we use the information about protein structure and protein-protein interactions to understand how cells uh, organize, how they interact? And this is a picture or a diagram of motor neuron pools. There are different motor neurons that uh, connect to uh, muscle, and uh, they separate into, into various pools, as you see here, dependent on the proteins that appear in them, that are expressed in them. And these are the proteins, and I'll be saying a lot more about that. Uh, 
These are proteins called nectins I'll be discussing that uh, play a role in organizing the inner ear and in many other roles. And in both cases, I'll be trying to, I'll try to convince you that there's a clear connection between molecular and cellular properties. And then the second half of my talk will be devoted to some very new work, which involves the, uh, how protein-protein interactions play a role in a specific problem in the design of the, in the wiring of the nervous system. In particular, how neurons know when to form synapses and when to avoid each other. So that will be the second part of the talk, but they'll all be based on common families of proteins. So the, the proteins that we're interested in, and these are generally how adhesion proteins are organized. This is supposed to represent a cell membrane. They're multi-domain proteins. Uh, I'll be talking first about what are called classical cadherins. They have five immunoglobulin-like domains uh, and uh, a transmembrane region and a cytoplasmic region. I'll be talking about protocadherins, nectins. They all look like this, though, multi-domain proteins uh, with some connection to the cytoplasm. Um, this shows, in the case of classical cadherins, what that connection sort of looks like. There's an unstructured region. The outside, the extracellular domain is structured. The cytoplasmic domain is not but it forms complexes with beta-catenins, alpha-catenin, and ultimately links to the actin cytoskeleton. Almost, every, in fact, everything I'll be talking about today involves recognition, which takes place outside the cell. I won't be talking about the various cytoplasmic processes that are initiated by recognition. So the basic question is, how does protein recognition translate into cellular recognition? So what got me into this field was uh, 15 years ago or so, when Larry, actually, uh, who's in our department, uh, gave a talk in my group meeting trying to get my lab interested in the following sort of problem. This is a uh, image of a developing chick embryo after six days. This is the ectoderm, and this shows that the cells here express a protein called E cadherin, E for epithelial. And you can see that these cells are separate from this inner set of cells which form the neural tube. And these proteins, these cells express N cadherin, N for neuronal. And it has been, they were discovered by Takaichi quite a few years ago. And the basic thought then was that this is very simple. E cadherin doesn't stick to N cadherin. So these are, the, the thought was that they were homophilic proteins so that when cells start expressing egg cadherin, those cells would break off from the cells creating E cadherin, giving rise to this sort of early developmental process. So uh, we had at the time models, but now we have crystal structures of E and N cadherin. You can imagine the membrane over here and here. So these are coming out from the membrane. They sort of form a banana shape and only bind at the external domain, the EC1 domain. And the, there's a lot to say about this, but I won't today. The interaction is, involves what's called a strand swapping. You see there's a tryptophan from one protein, from one monomer that's inserted into a pocket in the other and vice versa. So they, they sort of exchange the beta strand. That's how they bind. And the question uh, that I actually posed a graduate student at the time was, uh, why, how are they different? How is the N and cadherin different? They're about 70% identical. And it was the fellow working on it was an MD PhD student. And they all want to get their PhDs within three years. Uh, so I told him that if he could tell me why they were different, he would get his PhD and he could go on to do other stuff. So uh, he, he basically. We had structures or models of, this is just the membrane distal interacting domain of E cadherin, N cadherin, and he built a model of EN, and all he had to do was tell me what was wrong with this model, why E doesn't bind to N, and how these two guys are different. And after a year or two, he couldn't figure it out, and the models looked as, as good as, the heterophilic models looked as good as the homophilic ones. Uh, and at that point, I became an experimentalist. Uh, so we actually used a, a analytical ultracentrifuge and uh, SPR, uh, surface plasmon resonance, to 
measure the binding affinities of these proteins, and we found a few things. Number one, that N cadherin sticks to N quite more strongly than E to E. This is a 100 micromolar, this is a 20 micromolar binder. And EN actually bound better than EE. So th these molecules actually did bind heterophilically. And uh, this came as some, somewhat of a surprise, but it uh, sort of set us on our path after these experiments were done. He did, Peter Chen, his name was, did get his PhD. So it, it all worked out for him. But this uh, gave us a different picture of these proteins in that they were heterophilic. And then the question was, well, why do the cells that express E and N coherent, why do they separate from each other? And uh, the answer to that, we believe, ah, I'll just to set up the answer, I'll just point out that there are proteins I'll be talking less about that are called type 2 cadherins that are very similar, but they have a larger interface. They have insert two tryptophans with strand swapping, and they don't bind to type 1 cadherins. And the reason I tell you that is because we did the following set of experiments. So these are cells uh, labeled with red and green dyes. And if they both express, if both sets of cells express N and N cadherin, as you might expect, they mix together because N binds to N. When they express E cadherin again, they mix together. And this is a control with cadherin 6, a type 2 cadherin. And again, you see the same, the same result. Now, if you have some cells expressing N and some cells expressing cadherin 6, they form sep separate aggregates because N doesn't stick to 6. If you have cells expressing E and cadherin 6, again, they form separate aggregates. But when you f have cells expressing E and N together, they actually form separate aggregates, but they stick to each other. And in a way that's very crudely reminiscent of what one sees here, that N aggregates in the middle and E around it. And why is that true? Because N sticks to N, has a higher affinity for N than E to E. So the concepts that might work at a molecular level work at a cellular level. The most strongly aggregating uh, cells will maximize their interactions and therefore form a central aggregate. The weaker ones will aggregate around the stronger ones, interact with each other, and with the central core. So in very, very crude, I, I know I'm going through this very sort of uh, say superficially, but it, very quickly, the concepts that, that simple thermodynamic concepts are working here at a cellular level. So that's what I want to say for type, about type 1 cadherins. Now, another family of proteins that are cell-cell recognition proteins called nectins, uh, and these, are, these actually have three domains. They're immunoglobulin domains. And we solve the structures of a bunch of them, and they all look alike. Uh, they form an interface, again, at the membrane distal region. Uh, and when we measured the binding affinities of nectins, then we found that their behavior is very different than classical coherence. These are homophilic binding affinities. And they range, you can see, from 0.4 to, what, 200 or so micromolar. And actually, a point I want to make, uh, membrane binding proteins tend to have much weaker affinities than uh, soluble proteins, than, than cytoplasmic proteins. These numbers are actually quite, quite typical. Anyway, you see, these are the range of affinities. You see that nectin-1 binds to itself, say, more strongly, th strongly than nectin-3 binds to itself. But now when you do an experiment with, say, a Biacor apparatus where you flow nectin-3 or other nectins on a chip containing nectin-1, you see that 3 binds to 1 more strongly than 1 binds to 1. So these proteins are heterophilic binding proteins, primarily. They're also homophilic. And by doing all the measurements, you get some kind of a matrix, n binds you know, n1 to n3, n4, etc. And how this works is, is, ah. So these are experiments done in our collaborators' lab, Sergei Troyanovsky. And what's nice is, I'll explain this in a minute, you see these molecular properties manifest at a cellular level. So these red cells express an, a nectin-1, and the green cells express nectin-1. And you can see 
at the interface between these, between red and red, red and green, and green and green, you see a buildup of proteins. Those proteins are diffusing to the cell-cell interface because they stick to each other. And you see what are called, we'll call junctions from now on, uh, at all interfaces. Now if you express nectin-1 with nectin-2, nectin-1 doesn't bind to nectin-2, so you only see junctions within a single color, within a single type of protein. You don't see anything in between them. But now when you express nectin-1 with nectin-3, all of a sudden you see the strongest junctions between the red and the green, because nectin-1 and nectin-3 is the strongest binding interaction. So, these proteins, it's not surprising. They're diffusing, they're finding their partners where they can gain the most interaction, sort of free energy. That's where they're going to show up. So again, the properties of the individual proteins are being reflected by their behavior on cell surfaces. Maybe not surprising, but it's, it's nice to see it. By the way, I should say I'm happy if anybody wants to interrupt at any stage, please, please do. Uh, the way these proteins are designed is, is very clever and very simple. If you want to design a heterophilic protein, put a charge there, and on the protein it binds to most strongly have an opposite charge. So if, if these two proteins dimerize, you'll have this sort of red negative region interacting with another glutamate. There'll be some repulsion, but in the case of nectin-3, there's a lysine, there'll be an attraction. There's a very nice way of designing Homo heterophilic proteins, and this is the way that the nectins work. Uh, what's very sort of nice at a cellular level, this, these are cells uh, which uh, contain either nectin-1 and nectin-3, and, the, and this is, these cells are in the inner ear. I admit I don't remember of what organism, but I assume it's mouse. But you see they form a checkerboard pattern, and when you knock out nectin-3, the checkerboard pattern basically goes away. And this is exactly what you expect from heterophilic proteins. If you want to maxi maximize the favorable interactions, then you're going to have, they're heterophilic at the molecular level, they're going to be heterophilic at the cellular level. And that, the way to optimize this is through a checkerboard. So again, the properties of the individual proteins are being reflected by, uh, you know, by the, by, by the behavior of the cells that contain them. Uh, and this uh, is sort of, I guess, uh, an example of some place we're going. It's just something I, I like showing because I never in my life when I started uh, as a computational chemist dreamed I'd be showing a picture of a stained kidney. Uh, but this is what this is. Uh, th these pr uh, the kidney is being stained for different types of cadherins. This is called a nephron which is a filtering unit in a kidney. And uh, some regions of it contain E. cadherin, which is a type 1, cadherin 6, which is a type 2. I already told you that type 1s and type 2s don't bind to each other. So what happens in between, there's a region that contains both type 1s and type 2 cadherins, so it can bind in both directions. So uh, again, what at least very qualitatively, and I know I'm hand-waving a lot, we can understand some of the simpler aspects of this development of a nephron based on the adhesion properties of the individual proteins. We are hoping to now, using CRISPR technology, to design artificial kidneys uh, by changing. We, we can change affinities of these proteins almost at will, and that's something that we're hoping to do, and this work is being done with Rosemary Semponia, a nephrologist, uh, and a PhD uh, at, at Columbia. So that's a sort of a, almost an introduction. There's the properties of proteins on cell surfaces are reflected in the properties of the uh, behavior of the cells. Now, what happens at the interfaces between cells? This is it's not enough to say recognition. There's complicated things going on, and this is a picture. I took from a textbook, Essential Cell Biology, and what you see, these are cells stained with E. cadherin, and uh, see, the E. cadherin is distributed all over the surface of the cell, and as soon as these cells come in contact, 
you see basically the proteins diffusing to the interfacial region. And you can see the increase in fluorescence intensity. So that's, that's what's going on. Well, it turns out that in the case of classical cadherins, these interfacial regions called a form eventually fixed junctions called adherence junctions. And we're interested in the properties of those junctions and what that means for signaling. So we, when we solve the structures of E and N cadherin, uh, and also of another cadherin, C cadherin, we found that they, formed, they all formed a very distinct crystalline lat looking lattice, or crystalline lattice in the case of the structures, uh, where this is the trans interaction. Trans, in the language I'll be using in this talk now, means interactions of proteins in different cells. Cis are interactions of proteins in the same cell. So this is the interaction I already showed you. But in addition, there's a second interaction you can see going this way. This is trans, this is cis. You can see the lattice. It's a, it's a two-dimensional lattice seen in a crystal. And we suggested that maybe this lattice is what forms between cells, but before I get to that, what's very interesting is when we, I, I already told you we can measure the binding affinities of cadherins, and they're depending on which one, 10 to 100 micromolar or so. We couldn't measure the, this interaction, which we thought might be a crystal contact. Because we could, we, when we just tried to measure this in solution, we couldn't measure it. So it's very weak, uh, less than one millimolar. But when we connect these uh, cadherins to liposomes first, you see that the liposomes form a there's, a, there's a clearly ordered structure between the liposomes. But when we make mutants when, of this, once we have the cis interaction, which has some hydrophobic groups, we simply replace one or two hydrophobic groups with aspartic acids. We disrupt this interaction and you lose structure. So we're disrupting an interaction that's too weak to measure. And yet, we're seeing a strong effect on structure. But more interestingly, this is a uh, image of a junction formed in live cells transfected with wild type E cadherin. And when we mutate, again, we, the cis interaction, we no longer see aggregation, or there's very little aggregation in the cell cell. Uh, contact regions. So again, disrupting an interaction that's too weak to measure has very significant effects on what happens in cells. So how is that possible? Uh, and I'm going to go through this quickly. There's a whole theoretical story, but I couldn't resist telling you about it quickly. What you have, uh, this is, I'm going to show you a simulation in a minute, but these are supposed to be cadherins moving on cell surfaces. And if they formed a cis interaction on their own, as I'll, I'll just tell you, that would signal to the cell that something has happened. But so they can't be allowed to form a cis interaction until they've seen another cell. So there has to be a mechanism whereby this interaction becomes strengthened by interactions with other, uh, with proteins from another cell. And the way we think this happens, and oh, caught myself here. Uh, you have two proteins that are connected to the surface. I'm not telling you how I do these simulations, but uh, have linkers that are fairly flexible between them and they move around quite a bit. If they're connected to another protein from another cell surface, then they have much less conformational freedom because they're linked at both sides to a membrane in the middle to one another. And see, I'm not good at this. And the point is these guys don't move so much once they form a connection with a protein on another cell. And we believe that it's this trans interaction that strengthens the cis, cis interaction. 
And this, is, uh, this sort of leads to the next step I'm about to show you is the question, the question we're asking is, can these proteins form a two-dimensional assembly on their own of the, sh of the sort I showed you on the cell surface? And this leads to sort of all kinds of theoretical issues, but the basic point is that when we calculate or think or measure binding affinities in solution, these proteins are moving in three dimensions. And when proteins interact on cell surfaces, they move in two dimensions, sort of two dimensions, quasi two dimensions. So that the affinities we measure in three dimensions, if we have to somehow relate them to affinities in two dimensions, and we have a whole theoretical framework that we use to calculate, the, to, to make the transformation. But I just want to show you a, another simulation before I get to the second part of the talk. So here's, here are cadherins. Uh, green and red means different cell surfaces here. Uh, when they in contact, we draw them blue. So there's three colors here, green, red, and blue. You don't see the blue yet. And the only difference between this lattice on the left and the lattice on the right is we've made the cis interaction a little stronger, consistent with a theory I haven't told you about. And this light yellow region is a, is a contact region. And I just want to show you the two sets. So we're moving these proteins around. Whenever they form a contact, uh, this is a Monte Carlo simulation, you see something come up in blue. So here on the left, the cis interaction is weak. The proteins diffuse to the interface, but there aren't, they, they move out because there's nothing keeping them there. Here there's some sort of a phase transition where the stronger cis interaction, the trans interaction is the same in both cases, but the cis interaction is strong enough to lead to some ordered structure, which is at least consistent with the self-assembly process we think is going on on, on cell surfaces. So in general, and this is a, a point I want to take to the second part of this talk, which begins now, is that these proteins have the capability of forming ordered structures on cell surfaces. Uh, we know that once these clusters form, they, they evolved in signaling to the cytoplasm and ultimately connect to the uh, actin cytoskeleton. We don't know if the ordered structure is important is if there's a connection between order outside and order inside, or whether order is just a way to assemble lots of proteins in one place. We don't know that yet. But we, are, but we do know that ordered structures form that can be disrupted b experimentally by disrupting the cis interaction. So that's sort of an overview of uh, the f what we've worked for many years. And uh, now I'm going to discuss a totally different problem which will relate closely, nevertheless, to what I've been talking about. And, I mean, this is a presumptuous title, How is the Nervous System Wired? I'm not going to tell you how, uh, but uh, this tells you how many synapses and how many neurons there are in different organisms, and that these neurons wire in precise ways is, is certainly absolutely remarkable, and uh, it involves different features of neurons. And the one I'll be concerned with is a phenomenon of self-avoidance. So here's an example of a cell body in Drosophila, and these are neurites extending from the cell body, and what you see is that they don't touch each other. They avoid each other. Uh, and here's an example of neurons in a vertebrate, in mouse, and you see the same self-avoidance phenomenon. So the question is that I'll be addressing is, what is the basis of this self-avoidance? Uh, for Drosophila, much of our understanding at the sort of genetic level and the neurobiological level comes from work from, oh, I don't have his name here, Larry Zapersky's lab, who uh, worked with, uh, talk and study the properties of a family of proteins called DSCAMs, Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule, um, Flies don't get Down syndrome, but these proteins are related to vertebrate uh, proteins. And here's what happens. This is a, uh, a Drosophila neuron. When you knock out this gene cluster, you see now that the neurites bind to each other. 
So this establishes the role of DSCAMs, which I'll be talking a little bit more about. This is, again, work from Larry Zapersky's lab. In vertebrates, this is a, sort of a starburst amacrine cell. Again, when you knock out a gene cluster, you see now the dendrites are sticking to each other. And the proteins that do this are called press, clustered protocadherins, and they're related to the cadherins I've been talking about. Um, and what I'm going to do is briefly tell you, uh, at a molecular level, how the DSCAMs work. Uh, again, Sapersky's work, and then get to our own on vertebrate neurons. But there's a very, very sort of counterintuitive thing going on. So here's a diagram of two neurons, red and, and blue, and they can form synapses with each other. Uh, but they don't, see red is binding to blue, but they don't synapse within the same cell. And it turns out each neuron has a unique barcode that defines it and tells it that it's different or, you know, than, than some other neuron. But where, where it gets counterintuitive is that the proteins, both in Drosophila and in vertebrates, are homophilic adhesion proteins. So, and it's adhesion that leads to repulsion. And why, and, and in fact, it must be that way, because what you want is a specific mechanism whereby two cells will repel each other. And I don't, I've never found anyone who could tell me how you could make two proteins repel each other specifically. We have, lo there are lots of ways proteins can bind specifically, but how do you make them repel specifically? You have positive charge, negative charge, there's not a lot you can do. So specificity begins with adhesion, and then adhesion leads to repulsion through activation of cytoplasmic phenomena. So when you have two neurites from the same neuron, they bind and then repel. When they're from different neurons, they don't bind, therefore they don't repel. That's the counterintuitive part of the story. But you need to remember that because it can be confused. Other, other, I get confused all the time. So in the case of DSCAMs, there are, uh, the, the proteins have three domains which uh, are alternatively spliced, IG2, IG3, and IG7. We know that the structures of, of these proteins from David Eisenberg's lab. And basically, they, IG2 binds to 2, 3 to 3, 7 to 7. There's 12, 48, and 33 splice forms. If you multiply out all the possibilities, you get 19,000 distinct proteins. And what Zapersky's lab showed is that these proteins are all strictly homophilic. They only bind to each other. And that leads to very interesting protein design questions. How do you design 19,000 closely related proteins only to bind to each other? And um, obviously nature has done it, and I can, it's, it, it maybe isn't all that complicated. But this is, how they, this is how they work. And this leads to sort of a, an issue which is talked about, but uh, is, is, uh, it's essential that we think about. There aren't clear answers for these scams. You have 19,000 distinct proteins and 10 to 50 isoforms per cell. So what that means is through stochastic splicing, uh, each neuron, say neuron A, will select 10 to 50 of the possible 19,000 choices it has. Let's say in this case, there are only six to, to simplify the figure. So this shows that there are six different isoforms chosen. There may be a thousand copies of each, but six different isoforms chosen. Here's another neur uh, a neuron with six isoforms chosen, of which two are the same, the yellow and the blue. So let's say they were all the same. Then you'd have homophilic interaction. The cells would be the same. Uh, but by having this opportunity to choose six, in this case from 19,000, you get differences. But then you get to a question, well, you don't want these cells to stick to each other. What if five out of six were the same? You know, what if 19 out of 20 were the same? You'd expect them to bind. You know, the one that doesn't bind would get out of the way, so to speak. And one doesn't really know what the number is and the, the people working on Drosophila haven't worked this out, but it raises sort of a, 
term, the tolerance for common isoforms. How many isoforms can be different and the cells still don't bind to each other? And they, they assume 10, 20 percent. But putting that aside, it's clear that given a choice of 19, given a choice of 19,000 isoforms, it's not that hard intuitively to imagine selecting a few so that the probability that any two neurons would have the same set is very small. So Drosophilus solved the problem with 19,000 proteins. Okay, without, you now this is what's known today. Now in the case of vertebrates, uh, there's actually gene clusters uh, of protocadherins. There's, there's an alternative splicing going on here, but alter, uh, stochastic promoter choice. Uh, and there are th different clusters. But the point is that in the case of vertebrates, in the sake of mouse, for example, there are only 58 proteins, not 19,000. So mice accomplish, being having more complicated brains than flies, mice accomplish this problem, you know, solve this problem with 58 proteins. So the mechanism working in Drosophila can't be working in vertebrates. But again, this is to remind you that if you knock out a gene cluster, you, you lose self-avoidance. So we want to figure out, I'm going to try to tell you how I think mice accomplish the same task. So working with uh, Tom Maniotis' lab, with postdoc in his lab, Etu Chan, we first studied the binding properties of these proteins. And these are cells expressing uh, different protocadherins, red, you know, and they're red and green uh, fluorescing cells. And you can see this when, if we look at the diagonal, you see that all the cells aggregate together, which means that these are homophilic proteins, beta-4 to beta-4, you see there's mixed aggregates. Any other combination they don't bind to each other. You see the cell, they form separate aggregates. So we're really using cell aggregation as a probe of binding. And what you see again, as is the true for Drosophila, these are completely homophilic proteins. They don't bind heterophilically. But the really interesting and surprising observation we, we made in studying these cells is that well, you know, let me just take you through it. Uh, actually, you have to start on the, on the right, the way this is organized. These are cells that express three different protocadherins. Don't worry about their names. And in the figure on the right, all three uh, in the red and green cells are the same. And they form nice aggregates. But if two are the same and one is different, the cells don't, don't bind to each other. So one incorrect protein is getting in the way of two correct proteins. Is that clear? I hope, I hope it is. And so there's what we call an interference mechanism. You might think intuitively, if you have three different classes of proteins on the cell surface, which is what I said a few minutes ago, if one of them doesn't bind, it'll just diffuse away and the other two guys can bind to each other. But they don't. One incorrect protocadherin is enough to disrupt cell-cell contact. And we've done experiments with up to five expressed in the same cell. One incorrect one interferes with binding. And we believe that it's this mechanism this, that lies at the heart of how protocadherins work. Uh, so uh, we solve the structure. I, 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 I say we solve the structure. It's re I, I couldn't, I don't know how to solve a structure. Say that. But Larry does, and we have this common lab, so I always feel a little comfortable saying we we solve, but I'll say it. Uh, we solve the structure uh, of protocadherins. I see this figure is uh, not so clean. We solve the uh, structure of a few of them. This is what it looks like. As opposed to classical cadherins, these guys form anti-parallel contacts. These are very similar proteins to the cadherins I've been showing you, yet they interact in a completely new way. Instead of forming a banana shape, they're very straight, and you can see they form this anti-parallel sort of head-to-tail structure where EC1, the membrane distal region, connects to EC4, EC1, 4, 2, 3. This is, how, this is the interface they form. Uh, but that doesn't tell us anything about interference. Uh, I guess we've mapped 
we, we understand how they bind, we understand which residues le lead to specificity. Uh, I won't be discussing more of that. This slide is crucial, uh, so I want to take you through it. Um, we made constructs with different numbers of domains, so, and then assayed their binding both in a biophysical assay, basically analytic, analytical ultracentrifuge, and in cell assays. And it's this combination of information that taught us something very different. So if we have a construct of only three domains, it's a monomer in solution, it doesn't form a dimer because you need all four, and it doesn't affect cell aggregation. If you have a construct of four domains, they form a dimer, which is what we see in the crystal structure. If we transfect cells with four domain constructs, the cells aggregate nicely. So that shows you that the four domains that we see in the crystal structure are enough to aggregate cells. Uh, and we do that with large, larger constructs as well. The critical observation is this, when we cut out, well, we move EC1, so we have a construct with two to six, it forms a dimer, but it doesn't aggregate cells. And from this and other evidence, we know that this forms a cis dimer. So cis dimer on its own, we've killed the trans interaction, we've only left the cis interaction. And see, it doesn't aggregate cells, it forms a dimer. When we have full constructs in solution, we already know it aggregates cells, and we know it forms a tetramer. So this series of experiments tells us that the recognition unit of a protocadherin is a cis dimer, which then interacts homophilically with proteins on the other cell surface. And there's two ways this cis dimer could interact, could, it, it could form a tetramer in solution, it's certainly, this is, this is what happens in solution. But there's also a possibility of some sort of a zipper, which I'll show you in a second, where it forms an extended assembly, which I'll get to in a second. But the basic notion then is that this is what happens, this cartoon is what happens on cell surfaces. We know that the cis interaction, I didn't tell you this, is, is promiscuous. Any protocadherin can interact with any protocadherin in cis. So if you have different isoforms shown here in different colors, you're going to get a combination, you're going to get some statistical distribution of dimers. But the way to maximize interactions is, see, some of these dimers are heterophilic, like this one here, it's red and blue. The cis is the same, but they're different trans. So this, this if you start with red, two reds, it can bind to a red and a blue, which can find another blue. And in this way, you can get maximum number of interactions between cells. And this is at least consistent with the notions I've been talking about of, of cis and trans interactions and lattice assembly. So what's nice is that this gives us a mechanism for self-avoidance. So let's pretend that we start I'm just going to show you how a lattice might grow. Red and blue, red, blue, green. If all the isoforms on both cells are the same, any protein can always find a partner of another color be because it's going to be there some, uh, in some dimer. And therefore, these aggregates can grow at will. But now, let's say we have a single mismatch. When you start trying to grow the chain, you quickly get to a situation where this green has no partner on the other cell and the assembly stops. It's sort of a chain termination mechanism. So if, we, if you actually calculate, which we did here, the size of it, the average size of an assembly, this is a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, let's say there are a thousand copies per cell shown here in black. The assembly, if, if there are no, this is the number of mismatches. If there are no mismatches, the assembly comes up to be the, basically related to the size, to the number of proteins. If there's even a single mismatch, then the size of the assembly goes down to 
what is this, 50 or so, and then the, decreases very sharply after that. So the argument we're making, the suggestion we're making, is that th this effective poisoning of this assembly is the recognition mechanism, how cells tell self from non-self. It, it translates into the size of the assembly they form, which we would then suggest affects what happens in, in the cytoplasm. Uh, the, the model is consistent with, the, with all the data, at least it explains this remarkable ability of 58 proteins to do the job of 19,000 proteins. Uh, as shown here, th these scams have 19,000. They basically function by having this great diver molecular diversity. We think, at least we're suggesting, that protocadherins function with an interference mechanism which allows it to, them to generate the even greater diversity, by the way, than protocadherins uh, do. We're obviously uh, in the process of testing these ideas and there are a number of ways to do it, but the critical connection then between binding and repulsion, remember ultimately binding leads to repulsion, is, is we're claiming in the size of the assembly. Uh, we'll see if that's true or not. Uh, this is just to sort of want to summarize that uh, from point of view of protein design, it's sort of remarkable that these proteins, there are other, you know, can form so many different interfaces and it's just one of the wonders of, of nature that this, that this can happen. I'm not going to be discussing them. So let me just finish by mentioning sort of key people. I say we have a, a large lab and lots of wonderful collaborators. Uh, we have people doing solution biophysics, uh, computer simulations, the protocadherin work, the people in red worked on the protocadherins, uh, Rotem Rubinstein, Kerry Goodman did the crystallography, a uh, large protein production group. The simulations were done together with Avinoam Ben Shoul in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and the protocadherin work is done in collaboration with the Maniatis lab, and I briefly showed you some kidney stains from Rosemary Simponia's lab. So thank you very much for your attention. So it may well be, we don't yet know how many isoforms are expressed. We know it's on the order of 10 to, in, in, in uh, amacrine cells, it's, I think it's 15, but we don't really know the actual number. There may be more isoforms in, 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 ver in invertebrates, we're not sure yet. Oh. If there's too, many, too, too, too much poison, then the cell won't wrap that each other. If you notice, there's no poison, then they will always find it. Well, so you, you have, this is where you, there's, there's a random selection of, pro, of different proteins that takes place at the RNA level or at the DNA level. So uh, that's the mechanism for choosing these different proteins, is, is these different isoforms, is unclear, but uh, the point is, in the same cell, there's no problem because they're all the same. There are dendrites coming out from the same cell body, but the dendrites come from the same cell. They have the same protein. So they'll always stick to each other and then repel each other. So the trick for any other cell is not to stick. And what we're suggesting is that even a single mistake is enough to make sure you don't stick. And that happens randomly. It just the probability that the same cells will be produced, the same proteins will be produced in different cells, is very small. So, yes, yeah. So, in the interference mechanism, there's going to be an intermediate the, or something that the cell needs to recognize. But how does it distinguish between? Are you just waiting for the next monomer to come in? And Um, the monomer, we, we would argue that the monomer isn't there. There may be small clusters formed. So, but, but once you start in a, maybe I don't understand your question there. So, so in both cases, you're saying that the, the, the 
mm -hmm. now, right? Mm -hmm. so, so if you're missing something that allows you to continue building, how do you know and distinguish between it's really missing versus you're just waiting for it? Oh, implicit, implicit in this is that the fusion on the surface is fast enough that things will happen at, at the proper time. There's, there's, there's so many, I mean, many assumptions in, in this model, but implicit is, yes, is, is that if something is there, it will find its place in a, in a short enough time to let the chain to grow. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I say it's consistent with everything we know about these proteins, but maybe there's something we haven't thought of that's always possible. I noticed most of the structures that you showed us are static structures, and I'm curious how flexible these, uh, these assemblies are and how does that impact the behavior? Well, you did notice I had a simulation of the molecules moving. <laughs> yes, so the, the cadherins, um, the classical cadherins, oh, all the cadherins have three calciums between each domain that make them semi-rigid. Oh. Nevertheless, they're fairly flexible. So if I do, if I, in that simulation I showed you, um, if I fix the membrane here and just ask what's the region that the external domain moves, it's about 20, 30 angstroms. So, but you have five flexible regions, so they're quite flexible. The protocadherins that bind this way are far less flexible because they, they have a much larger interface. So they're far less flexible. So they are, you, you could, so one question is does, what effect does flexibility have on their properties we actually think that flexibility, interdomain flexibility, affects binding affinities. We've shown that there are alternate conformations of binding that we think there's an entropic driving force for some of these proteins. But I don't. Th I, I, th I think beyond affecting binding affinities, I'm not sure what else. But again, we're in the earliest stages. Unless, unless, as I say, unless the size, unless the size of the cluster is what's responsible for signaling, in which case, no, it wouldn't make any difference. In the case of the classical coherence, one, one of the experiments we're, we're doing now is, I said that you need cis and trans to get this assembly. So what we're, we're doing now is we're making the trans interaction much stronger, in which case, perhaps we can assemble as many proteins in the interface as we do with weaker trans and stronger cis. And the question we're asking is, is the order important? So if we, if we make strong trans interactions, there'll be no order, but there'll be enough, the same number of proteins. So that's the kind of game we're playing. So we, we don't really know the answer to that yet. But yeah, I mean, that's the kind of experiment we're thinking of.